Hello there, welcome to this revision video for GCSE History Living in Nazi Germany. This is part four, the impact of the Second World War on Germany. In this topic, we're going to look at the impact of the Second World War on Germany. We're going to look at the move to a war economy and its impact on the German people from 1939 until 1942. We're then going to look at growing opposition from the German people, including from elements within the army. So things like the Stauffenberg plot, for example. We're then going to look at the impact of total war on the German people from 1943 until 1945. OK, so Germany actually expanded greatly during the Second World War, as you can see from these couple of maps. At first, many Germans did not actually experience that much hardship with the arrival of war and actually gained as Germany conquered new territory and the economic benefits that are brought. But as the war went on, rationing was introduced. Germany was badly affected by shortages and then the frequent Allied bombing raids as well. And um, there was an increase in opposition to the Nazi regime and a huge turning point was Goebbels total war speech on the 18th of February 1943. Okay then, so this just gives you a little bit of an overview of some of the key events in World War II that was going on. So the um, Second World War began in September 1939 with Germany invading Poland and Britain and France declaring war on Germany two days later. Germany used the um, tactic of the Blitzkrieg to overwhelm countries like Belgium, the Netherlands and France in 1940. Um, in 1940 was when Churchill became the Prime Minister of Britain and British victory in the Battle of Britain postponed the invasion of Britain plans from the Nazis. Um, Germany conquered much of Eastern and Western Europe during this time in 1940, which brought food, wealth, resources back to Germany. Big turning point was in 1941, our Operation Barbarossa saw the invasion of Russia. The German army became bogged down in a four year battle. And then the USA joined the war in December 1941 after Pearl Harbor was attacked by Japanese forces. In 1942, Germany suffered setbacks on the Russian front at Stalingrad. The Allied began to raid cities like Berlin and Cologne and they became more intense and more frequent. The Americans won a naval victory in the Pacific War, which is a huge turning point. Uh, and 1942 is also the year where the mass murder of Jewish people began in the Holocaust, the so-called final solution. In 1943, the surrender at Stalingrad in Russia marked Germany's first major defeat. That led to Goebbels' total war speech at the Sports Palace in Berlin on the 18th of February in 1943. In 1944, the Russian offensive gathered pace in Eastern Europe. D-Day in the West, Allied invasion of France took place. Paris was liberated in August 1944. In 1945, um, the um, war had turned decisively in favour of the Allies. Auschwitz was liberated by Soviet troops in January 1945, and the victory in Europe um, took place in May 1945, with um, Adolf Hitler committing suicide a few days before. So, in terms of war economy, how did World War II change the lives of German people? So, when the Second World War broke out, there was huge fear in Germany. People stocked up on food, sandbags were given out and stacked against ground floor windows to protect against bomb blast, air raid sirens sounded, blackout regulations were issued, curbstones were painted white and luminous arrows appeared on walls to direct people to air raid shelters in the dark. Children remaining in cities were issued gas masks. So, there was... Um, a, 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 a big effect already on Germany's home front uh, when the war broke out. Um, war economy, and um, the idea of a war economy is that um, the whole German economy needed to be directed towards the war, or much of the German economy needed to be directed towards the war. Um, in April 1940, German troops marched into Denmark and Norway, and the escalation of the war in 1940 required a huge increase in weapons and ammunition. In December 1939, Hitler had announced that Germany would become a, quote, war economy. Expenditure on the military rose dramatically from 1939 into 1940. Goods linked to the military increased from 23% of the economy in 1939 up to 47% in 1941. By 1941, 55% of the German workforce was employed in war-related work. However, different groups like the SS, the Wehrmacht, who were the army, the Luftwaffe, who were the air force, Navy and local Nazi leaders competed for the economy, making it inefficient. So there needs to be a little bit more organisation of this so-called war economy. And you can see there in the stats in the table, um, the increase, the huge increase, the number of tanks being produced and the number of aircraft being produced during this time. So Albert Speer in February 1942, um, he was Hitler's architect. He was appointed Minister of Armaments and War Production, a trusted ally of Hitler who famously told him, Speer, I'll sign anything that comes from you. 
So he was appointed minister in charge basically of the war economy. Now he gave factories increased independence, which was known as industrial self-independence, but at the same time created the central planning board to keep control of the economy. Now the main policies were to focus factories on producing a single product, employ more women in factories, use concentration camp prisoners as workers, forced labor, and exclude skilled workers from compulsory military service. So the focus on the war economy led to um, a decrease in consumer goods and it led to hardship for German people. Now the first winter of World War II was the coldest in living memory. In January 1940, daytime temperatures across northern Germany rarely rose above minus five degrees. The freezing temperatures made travel almost impossible. A shortage of coal led to factories not engaged in war production, receiving no supplies. German civilians struggled to heat their homes and people had to forage for firewood in parks and forests and some had no heating at all. The shortages um, were around because of the war economy. So what that meant is that a lot of um, the focus of the economy was on preparing for the war and fighting the war. And therefore there was a shortage of food and other products. Germany um, being at war could no longer rely on imports and agricultural production was reduced with so many men at war. This meant that rationing was introduced and the supply of food, clothes, shoes and coal was controlled. Now the system of rationing in Germany was pretty complex. People were given colour coded ration cards for different products. Ration cards of German Jewish people were marked with a red J and were given a lower allocation. They could only shop at certain times. Now most Germans were adequately fed during World War II, or at least in the early years, but Germans spent much time queuing and the quality of products was really poor. Complaining could lead to arrest. In the early phase of the war, resources and supplies brought back from occupied lands did bring some prosperity for some. Now this post that you can see there, a 1942 poster saying, hamster shame on you, made to encourage people not to hoard, shows you that hoarding must have been an issue and a problem in Germany, um, in that home front, in the Second World War. Um, and you can obviously infer that from the thinking about the purpose of that source. So how did World War II change the lives of German people? Well, in terms of women, the Nazi leadership was divided over the role of women. Albert Speer wanted women to work in factories to boost production, but Hitler wanted them to stay at home to continue their role as wives and mothers. Women were never conscripted into factories in Germany. Restrictions on women in, in education from the early Nazi period were lifted during the war. From 1939, women aged 25 had to complete six months labor service before being able to enter full employment. Most women worked six months in agricultural jobs. More women entered the workforce with 760,000 women working in war industries and this rose to 1.5 million by 1941. But this was a small proportion out of a population of 30 million women. With men away at war, most women remained at home during World War II. In terms of bombing and evacuation, the RAF, the Royal Air Force, the British Air Force began a bombing campaign, um, campaign against industrial areas in northern Germany. On the 28th of August 1940, Britain bombed Berlin and in autumn 1940, Germans faced air raids three or four nights a week. So in September 1940, the Germans introduced a program of evacuation, not dissimilar to evacuation programs introduced in places like Britain. It was known as the KLV and I'd suggest you just learn it as the KLV. It stands for Kinder Land Verschickung um, and what it meant is that all children below 14 were eligible to stay for six months in a rural area. Those below 10 lived with families. Older children were put in camps run by the Hitler Youth. And the camps were quite strict and allowed the Nazis to extend their indoctrination of young people. Um, a little bit of an insight into a lack of support for what was going on in the war. Many parents did not let their children go. So a nice st statistic there, uh, only 40,000 of 260,000 el eligible children in Berlin took part in the KLV programme. So a little bit of a source focus, lots of sources on the Germany paper. Source one is a propaganda poster from Germany in 1940 and the text says, I also helped the Führer metal donation for the German people. So the source suggests German people helped support the war. The purpose of the source is to persuade people to donate metal, which suggests there were shortages and the government needed people to donate. And it also suggests women had an important role to play in the Second World War. And the hamster, shame on you poster, the purpose is to stop people hoarding food, suggesting there was a problem with hoarding. And the source suggests not all German people stuck to the rules over rationing, suggesting rationing was unpopular. OK, so one of the key questions is about how much German people supported the war. So we've already found out 
that as the war went on, there was going to be less support for the war. And we know that lots of people didn't support, for example, the evacuation program. Um, but during the war, there is an increase in opposition, including military opposition. So let's just have a look at the Stauffenberg plot. So the July bomb plot um, in 1944, often known as the Stauffenberg plot, it was a plot by unhappy army soldiers and it almost killed Hitler. And the plot was led by Colonel Klaus Graf von Stauffenberg. Now Stauffenberg was convinced that Germany was being led towards disaster and he blamed Hitler for this. So he plotted to assassinate Hitler. The plan was to kill Hitler with a suitcase of explosives and initiate something called Operation Valkyrie, which was an emergency order which would allow the plotters to use the reserve army to remove the SS and the Gestapo. Now, two attempts had been abandoned, but on the 20th of July, Stauffenberg made another attempt at Hitler's um, base called the Wolf's Lair, his headquarters in the east. The bomb exploded, but Hitler was not killed. He was actually protected by um, a, a pillar, basically, and um, a table leg. Now, Stauffenberg and the plotters were soon rounded up and killed, and Stauffenberg was, himself was killed by firing squad. The event actually led to an increase in propaganda and support for Hitler. Now, the military opposition from the Stauffenberg plot is one of the most famous events of opposition during the Second World War, but it wasn't the only example of opposition. There was opposition from people in the church. So Cardinal Galen is quite famous. In 1941, Cardinal Galen, who was a Catholic, delivered three sermons criticising the Nazis. He was known by his nickname, the Lion of Munster. Now, his sermons focused on the use of terror by the Gestapo, the taking of church property. And also, um, and this is the one that's most remembered, the murder of mentally and physically disabled people and his campaign against this actually was able to stop uh, Nazi policy and bring a halt to their euthanasia program. Now three Catholic priests who distributed the sermons were murdered but Galen survived as a very prominent and popular figure but he was kept under virtual house arrest between 1941 and 1945 but he did survive the war. Now Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Protestant pastor um, which means priest, and he joined the resistance in the 1930s and publicly spoke out against the Nazis in the 1930s, and he'd been banned from speaking and writing. But during the Second World War, he joined the Abwehr military intelligence group, where many army officers against the Nazis worked, and he discovered Nazi atrocities, particularly against Jewish people, and one of the ways that he resisted was that he helped Jewish people escape Switzerland. Sadly and tragically, he was arrested and killed by the SS. Okay, so the White Rose. So the White Rose um, were a group that was centered around Hans and Sophie Scholl at Munich University. Now, their opposition was that they produced a series of anti-Nazi leaflets. The first four were produced in the summer of 1942 and given to students, encouraging them to resist. The fifth leaflet in January 1943 made the group well known. It was called Appeal to All Germans, and it stated that Hitler just could not win the war. Between 6,000 and 9,000 leaflets were produced and distributed in nine cities around Germany, particularly in the south. The sixth leaflet was made after the German army failure at Stalingrad and encouraged Germans to resist. On the 18th of February 1943, the Shells brought a suitcase um, of leaflets to Munich University and left them in corridors, lecture rooms and threw them over a balcony to an atrium below. This last act was seen by a caretaker who told the Gestapo, who now knew the group based in Munich, and it led to their arrest. The Scholls were arrested, so Sophie and Hans both tried to take full responsibility to protect the others, but in the end, the most prominent members of the group, including Sophie and Hans, faced the People's Court and the day later execution by the guillotine. Just before he died, Hans shouted, long live, live freedom. Now, Hans and Sophie Scholl are well remembered for their very brave and determined resistance against the Nazis, and others were implicated in the White Rose um, of opposition as well. Okay, another example of opposition was the Rosenstrasse. So on the 27th of February 1943, the last Jews of Berlin were rounded up. One group of men was taken to the welfare office of the Berlin Jewish community, the Rosenstrasse. They were considered to be part Jewish and many had Aryan wives. The Aryan wives of these Jewish men gathered at the Rosenstrasse to protest. Now these protests led to the men being released in March 1943, with the Nazis claiming they never intended to deport them. However, deportation of all other Jews to the death camps continued. This is an important example of opposition of how a protest was organised and was able to influence and change what the Nazis were planning to do. So an interesting example to delve into more detail about the Rosenstrasse is to find out about Gad Beck. Now Gad Beck was Jewish and gay. Gad Beck survived the entire duration of Nazi rule living in Berlin. It's an incredible story. He was 19 when in 1941 his friends and neighbours began to be rounded up and deported. 
Gad was part of a group of men summoned to the Rosenstrasse in 1943. Protests led to him and other men being released. He made the decision to actively resist the Nazis and took a leading role in the Chug Chalutzi Jewish resistance group for the rest of the war. He was arrested by the SS in March 1945 but survived the war. After the war, he lived in Israel and returned to Berlin. He became the director of Berlin's Jewish Adult Education Center and a prominent gay activist. He died in 2012 at the age of 88. Another example of opposition was Otto and Elise Hampel. Elise's brother was killed fighting in the war in 1940 and this spurred them into action. Between September 1940 and autumn 1942, they hand wrote 200 postcards, urging people to refuse military service and not donate to the Nazis. Postcards were left at post boxes and stairwells in Berlin. Nearly all of the postcards were handed to the Gestapo, which shows the fear the public had of objects of resistance. There was also an increase in passive uh, resistance during the Second World War. It's hard for historians to know how much there was, as this tends to be less documented and less able to evidence actually the impact of it. But there is evidence to suggest there was um, an increase in people refusing to say how, how Hitler would do the Nazi salute, um, increase in people telling anti-Nazi jokes or reading anti-Nazi leaflets. We've already found out about people like the White Rose and Otto and Elise Hampel spreading leaflets and postcards, increase in people listening to foreign radio stations like the BBC, increase in people hiding or helping Jewish people, and an increase in people refusing to give to Nazi charities like Winter Relief. Opposition um, still remained a minority within Nazi Germany during World War II. Um, so although there were some heroic examples of opposition by people, it was still very, very difficult to oppose the Nazis during that time. One of the reasons for this might be a lack of knowledge. Most people had little direct experience of Nazi brutality, so it's difficult to know if ordinary Germans knew the scale of Nazi crimes. Yes, they almost certainly would have known that something was going on, but it wasn't openly talked about, not openly written about in the newspapers. A lot was covered up. Many claim they had no idea about events such as the Holocaust. They probably did, to be honest. They probably knew something was going on, but it, as it wasn't being openly spoken about, some people could claim a lack of knowledge and therefore um, not resist. In terms of fear, the nature of the Nazi regime meant people were scared to step out of line. During the war, persecution increased, making opposition really challenging. People knew the harsh punishments if they opposed the Nazis. We've seen, haven't we, about what happened to people that opposed the Nazis, what happened to people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, what happened to Hans and Sophie Scholl, for example. Nazi propaganda was really effective during the war years. Goebbels and his ministries fought hard to win the hearts and minds of German people and sold them the myth that Hitler would be their saviour. When the war started to go wrong, there was actually an increase in propaganda. When um, Hitler was nearly killed in the July bomb plot, there was actually an increase in propaganda um, and an increase in support for Hitler. People still turned in opposition, so the Protestant minister Wilhelm Kanaf was turned in after speaking out against the Nazis. There were people that were loyal right up until the end of the Second World War to the Nazis. Also, there were some Nazi successes, so Hitler's foreign policy was highly successful until 1941, until Operation Barbarossa and the invasion of the Soviet Union, invasion of Russia. The Nazis delivered on their promise to protect the German people. There was a massive program of bunker building, for example. Welfare schemes were set up to help people whose homes were destroyed by bombing. So some of these events um, convinced people to support the Nazis. OK, so the last element of this revision video is thinking about the impact of total war on the German people. So the defeat at Stalingrad on the Eastern Front led to the Nazis moving to total war in February 1943. Here's a source which is a poster published in 1943 which translates as all power stretched to total war, short a war. Rolling up your sleeves and joining in a war effort was a very common theme of wartime propaganda in Germany. So the defeat at Stalingrad on the Russian Front led to the Nazis moving to a, a phase called total war. Um, in January 1943, as we've seen, the Germans defeated by the Russians at Stalingrad. The British and French had pushed the Germans back in North Africa. So on the 18th of February 1943, Joseph Goebbels addressed a public meeting at Berlin's Sport Palast in a carefully staged managed propaganda speech. The banner um, that you can see there says Total War, Shortest War, and it dominated the scene. Um, the, the Total War speech was all about galvanising the German people to support the war effort and the idea that if everyone supported the war and was focused on it, that the war would end quicker. Um, some German people um, had already been sending things like fur coats to support German soldiers fighting in the East, another example of support for the war. Um, but for others, it only increased opposition to the war. Now, an interesting aside is that Goebbels actually made this total war speech on the same day that Hans and Sophie Scholl were arrested um, on the 18th of February 1943.
Okay, so in practice, what did total war actually look like? Well, one of the impacts was that women were mobilized into the war effort. Um, so three million women between the ages of 17 and 45 were called up to work, but only one million actually took up the call. And this, um, I think, shows that uh, many women were reluctant to get involved in the, um, in the Second World War, reluctant to go and sort of work in the factories in a way that women were doing in other countries like Britain, for example. And this was probably um, a legacy impact of some of Hitler's policies towards women in the 1930s. Another feature of Nazi total war was that anything that did not contribute to the war effort was to be eliminated. Everything had to contribute to total war. So this meant things like professional sport ended, magazines were closed, non-essential businesses were shut down. If they didn't support the war effort, it wasn't happening. Shortages would become worse as everything was directed to the war effort. So in August 1943, clothes rationing was suspended as the production of civilian clothes ended. Um, there was also a massive increase in propaganda. Remember, the Total War speech itself is a huge example of propaganda. So people were encouraged to embrace the idea of Total War, and for many, this was actually really effective. Now, one of the impacts for German people was that Allied bombing raids intensified uh, massively after 1943 in places like Hamburg and Dresden, for example. Um, so you can see here Goebbels writing about the impact of bombing raids on Berlin. He said, what I saw was truly shattering. The whole tear garden quarter has been destroyed. So is the section around the zoo. While the other facades of the great buildings are still standing, everything inside is burnt to the ground. Groups of people scamper across the street like veritable ghosts. How beautiful Berlin was at one time and how run down and woebegone it looks now. OK, so we'll just have a look at the impact of total war in a bit more depth and detail. So Allied forces increased their bombing raids on German cities. So cities like Hamburg and Berlin were devastated by the bombing raids, with homes being destroyed and thousands killed. 40,000 were killed in Hamburg alone. So that affected uh, German people's lives, the loss of homes, the low morale that would lead to deaths, injuries and fear. Um, another impact is that the Allies and Russians advanced through Nazi-occupied countries. So in August 1944, Paris was liberated in the east. Soviet forces entered Romania and Poland. Native Germans moved back into Germany itself, and that um, increased pressure on resources like food and fuel, for example, led to an increase in food shortages. Low morale led to military defeats. In July 1944, the Stauffenberg plot took place, and that led to an increase in arrests and executions. But the shock of the July bomb plot actually increased Hitler's popularity. The Gestapo and the SS arrested 7,000 people connected to the plot. Many were Wehrmacht officers. Wehrmacht is the German army, remember, and were replaced by Hitler loyalists. The Hitler salute, for example, became compulsory in the army. So there was an increased terror and fear. The army was being purged of those not loyal to Hitler. Now, another really important turning point is that in July 1944, Goebbels is made Reich trustee for total war. So Goebbels ordered half a million workers to become soldiers. Many had been working in factories and were replaced by untrained workers. The age limit for compulsory service for women was raised to 50. There was a massive increase in forced labor. By the summer of 1944, 7.6 uh, million foreign workers were brought to Germany from places like France, the Netherlands, for example. And this obviously had a huge impact on the occupied territories as well, which we'll come on to in the next revision video. Railway and postal services were reduced to save fuel, theatres, opera houses and music halls were closed, propaganda intensified. So there's a huge impact on daily lives, there's a loss of entertainment, increase in shortages, untrained workers were becoming soldiers, untrained workers were in the factories as well. So it's becoming pretty chaotic. Hitler also ordered the creation of something called the Volkssturm, which is the people's storm, that means, in October 1944. This was a national militia to defend Germany. So what the Volkssturm is, is it's basically um, getting people back home in Germany to create um, armed forces to actually defend Germany if Germany itself was um, attacked and invaded during the Second World War. So all males between the ages of 16 and 60 were forced to join the Volkssturm. Nazi officials patrolled the wards of German hospitals to get injured soldiers back into service. Members received just four days training and were issued with old rifles. So there's a huge negative impact on morale of seeing teenagers and middle-aged men as part of the Volkssturm. In 1945, Soviet and Allied forces made rapid progress against German forces. So the Soviets crossed Germany's eastern border in April and the 30th of April, Hitler took his own life. Germany fell apart in 1945. Shots ran out of supplies. People faced starvation. In February 1945, Dresden was firebombed, destroying 1,600 acres and killing 25,000 people. Despite all this, many fought on. But on the 2nd of May 1945, Germany surrendered. So basically, 
Uh, there was a complete breakdown in German society during this time. There was starvation, loss of morale and fear. The bombing raids in Dresden were particularly devastating. So as you can see here, um, by 1944, in terms of the actual war itself, Germany was defa facing defeat. D-Day saw the Allied forces of Britain, USA and Canada invade Nazi-occupied France, leading to the liberation of Paris. The success of the Western push from D-Day meant Allied forces were advancing on the River Rhine in the West. Meanwhile, in the East, Soviet forces were advancing too. So by 1945, there's chaos, destruction, and then obviously peace. But by 1945, Germany was overrun by Allied forces from the West and East. Germany was in total chaos. Um, and we know Hitler took his own life on the 30th of April 1945. The Third Reich was over. And this image, I think, really kind of sums it up. It's the East German city of Dresden. It was heavily bombed in February 1945 by British and US planes. Um, dropped 4,000 tons of high explosives, resulting in a firestorm across the city and 25,000 people dying. And you can just see the, uh, the terrible destruction there um, in that very famous image of Dresden in 1945. So the US and Soviet forces, they met up at the River Elbe in Germany as the advance from the West and the East had met up and the war was effectively over and it finished in May 1945. And obviously Germany would um, then be divided, the Cold War would happen, and obviously the rest is, is history. Okay, so that was um, a revision video about Germany at war. Thanks very much for listening. Goodbye.